Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Scott Lute and Greg White here with you on Supply Chain. And welcome to today's live stream. Gregory, how we doing? Wherever you are, including where one of our guests is, which is one of our most popular areas of audience, right? Around the world. So You are, you are right. And I'll tell you, such a trooper. And, and speaking of, we've got a couple of incredible panelists here today. Big, big show, right? Yeah. Yeah. And sorry, not to answer to answer your question. I'm doing pretty good <laughs> considering the Braves kept us up pretty late last night. Right. Yeah. And, and a couple of rain delays. That's right. So. But but Greg, on the flip side, yeah, we are we were in good company with one of the we movers were. and shakers across uh, uh, digital content and the burgers were good. And hey, the Braves won eight in a row. Those Mets are a good team. We dropped one. We'll see what happens tonight. But it really enjoyed the show as much as I'm going to enjoy this show here today. Yeah. Yeah. I'm look, really looking forward to this. I can't, I'm going to let you share the number of years, but I cannot believe the number of years these two companies have been partners. It is just staggering. It, you know what? I was about to throw some shade on a certain sports team that hasn't won a World Series almost, but I'm not going to go there. I'm going to, I'm going to be. <laughs> I'm not good there, but hey, folks, kidding aside, uh, I hope this finds you where wherever you are today. We're talking about several big topics: risk management and supply chain, of course, sustainability, and as Greg alluded to, a big partnership that's thrived over the last 50 years and it made a big impact. So, Greg, great panel, big topics, uh, great yeah. folks pouring in. You ready to get going? I am. Yeah, and I think it's important information for much of our audience, which wasn't born when this partnership started. How about that? Man, I bet the stories, the stories over the last 50 years, we'll try to get into some of those. Well, just the today. change in the business, right? Mm. I mean, think about where business was in 1970s, early 70s. Man. Wow. That's, that's a great observation. I mean, think about how much has changed in the last two years, much less the last 50. But uh, we're going to touch on some of, uh, of what's transpired and most importantly, what you need to do for the next five years, much less, less next 50 years, if you're in supply chain and or global business for that matter. But folks, we see folks coming in. We're going to say hello to a few people. We want to hear from you. So we'd love to get your take throughout the conversation. We're going to share many of those comments throughout the next hour. Use that chat bar and the cheap seats, the the sky, uh, the uh, uh, club seats, I, I think, since we're getting into football season. But you are the stars of the show, much like our two panelists. And we want to hear from you. Um, speaking of Greg, before we bring in our two uh, rock and roll stars here today, let's say hello to a few folks. Of course, Clay and Catherine and Amanda Chantel, you name it, uh, the, the wonderful production team that helps make these shows happen. Great to see all of you here today. Like clockwork, Greg, Shelly Phillips from Col beautiful Colorado. Yeah. Uh, tuned in once again. She's on the right side of that cold front that just came through the south, right? <laughs> I'll go with it. It seems a bit cooler out this morning. We didn't we didn't mention weather yet. I can't believe it. But Shelly, I uh, really enjoyed your commentary yesterday and uh, looking forward to you bringing it again today uh, via LinkedIn. Uh, let's see. Glormore is, uh, Glormore is back with us. I enjoyed your perspective. Uh, Greg, you may not know that Glormore's um, uh, husband works in our ports and there's, there's some stories to tell. So uh, Glormore, we'll have to dive in deeper soon. Define our U.S. or Georgia? Uh, West Coast ports uh, here oh, in the U.S. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, um, Joseph uh, tuned in from Austin, Texas. Beautiful Austin, Texas. Greg, and you and I rolled through there in the supply chain now van not too long ago. We may have had a meal or two there. Yeah. <laughs> Keep uh, it so weird. It is. <laughs> Keep it weird, Austin. Uh, love that place. Uh, Joseph, great to have you via LinkedIn. Muhammad tuned in from beautiful New York City uh, via LinkedIn. Great to have you here. Uh, Philando uh, tuned in from Huntsville, Alabama via LinkedIn. We were just talking about Huntsville earlier this yeah. week, Greg. Right. Space camp. Right. I think Philando was with us as well. That was on Monday on the buzz with uh, Kevin L. Jackson. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, Master Sergeant Jeremy During has been on a hot streak. Uh, greetings from Kansas to you via LinkedIn. Speaking of hot. <laughs> right. He was commenting earlier. Um on as we were kind of promoting the show in the military, they had this phrase called operational risk management. And a lot of the same principles from a, a risk standpoint were there, but the sustainability was defined a good bit different. I bet it's probably um, mission sustainability, but Hey, we'll get, maybe get Jeremy uh, to weigh in. It is um, funny how that 
word has become singularly defined now, isn't it? So I mean, true. it used to, used to mean now you have to like go back to uh, feasibility or maintainability, whatever. Uh, you need a, we need a new word. Yes, for business sustainability. <laughs> we really do. Uh, Muhammad tuned in from Somalia uh, via LinkedIn. Great to have you here. Looking forward to your perspective. Big Show Bob Bova is back with us. There he uh, is. Got a new headshot too, doesn't he? Yeah, is that new? Oh man, yeah, looking good. Yeah, uh, oh, oh, BSB or BSBB, I guess we're Big Show Bob Bova. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was running out of B's there, but uh, Bob, great to have you here today. Uh, Russ is tuned in. Russ has been has dropped some eloquent uh, perspective through some of our live streams. Greetings from London via LinkedIn. Uh, Sayantin's back with us. Murthy's back with us. Steve Lyons, man, Steve. Speaking of rock and roll stars, Steve was with us. Wednesday, Vine Line Logistics. Right. Uh, and look there, hungry to learn, he says. And since I haven't eaten actual lunch yet, <laughs> this should fill me up. So Steve uh, knows what goes on in the green room. He was a guest on Wednesday, <laughs> as Scott said. And it's usually talking about food, which we did today. And yes, we are starving. Now. Yes, <laughs> we sure are. Um, all right. So I know we couldn't hit everybody, but Ramon, Cecil, Archie, uh, uh, Kuzbu, uh, Saif, all of y'all, welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. We want to hear from you throughout the next hour. And uh, thanks so much for uh, joining. Um, okay, so Greg, with no further ado, yes, I want to uh, introduce our guest here today, and we're going to jump right in. You ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready, and I'm sure Rajesh is too. Come on, it's late his time. <laughs> That's right. We got to get him, get all his knowledge out of him and get him to bed. That's right, Hall of Famer. Uh, yeah. All right, so with no further ado, I want to welcome in Rajesh J, associate partner with IBM Global Business Services, and Mark Averskug, supply chain business network leader, vice president of solutions at SAP Ariba. Hey, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Rajesh, how are you doing? Great, great, Scott. Great to see you. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting the update from your your uh, bike race this weekend. We had we had a little fun talking about that this morning. Yeah, welcome um, aboard. And Mark, welcome to you as well. Well, thank you, Scott and Greg and Rajesh. It's great to be here. And uh, Greg, we were we were learning some new customs, or at least new to new to me, I guess. Uh, uh, every Thursday in Sweden, Greg, what's the tradition? <laughs> pancakes and pea soup. Pancakes and pea soup. Yeah, delicious pancakes, by the way. Well, I mean, not exactly like in the States, right, Mark? I mean, no, quite different. They're more yeah. like, uh, you know, thinner, um, yeah. larger and thinner, kind of like craze, but not not quite that thin. So, yeah, the <laughs> difference. Yeah. Well, but thank you for adding to our hungry factor, uh, Mark. Uh, but but hey, uh, speaking before we get into the kind of center plate items, we're going to continue food references throughout the next hour. Um, we understand that we have really all three of y'all, but certainly Rajesh and Mark, you are uh, passionate about travel and adventures. We heard some of those in, in some of the, the prep discussions. So that's where I want to start. So Rajesh, um, uh, we learned about some of your passions, but when it comes to travel, what's been one of your favorite recent adventures and where'd you go? So uh, recently uh, after COVID, I think the travels had become a lot of restriction on that. Uh, but I, I had traveled uh, Europe quite extensively, and in the recent times, in the last four or five months, due to this, you know, all this COVID and visa issues, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I traveled India quite a lot from the from the almost from the north to south. Uh, but but I I typically, uh, if you ask my favorite destination, I traveled a lot in Switzerland and in Nordics. So that's more more or less is my most favorite destinations. Wow, I love that. And I, I hear you're going to be writing a book on your travel soon. Is that right? <laughs> Maybe we'll, we'll challenge you later. I don't but, think uh, he's got time for that. <laughs> that. Right. Well, one other tidbit, and uh, really want to celebrate this. Uh, we learned in some of our prep conversations that you're a member of the illustrious uh, Industry Academy, which is basically like a Hall of Fame for industry. So, uh, Rajesh, great to have you here, and congratulations on, on all your contributions to industry. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Um, all right. So, Mark, um, 
if I don't want to share too much information, but you and your family have had some really cool adventures here lately. Uh, we were just touching on that a moment ago. Greg spent a lot of time in that neck of the woods. Um, yes. Mark, what's been one of your favorite uh, adventures here recently? Well, recently, yeah, when we talked before the, the show here, uh, I was telling you guys that I spend, I, I try and spend summers in Sweden. I live normally in Portland, Oregon, but I'm originally from Sweden and in my family tend to come over here and hang out and, and we have done so this year for a couple months as well. And while we're here, we try and take off, take the opportunity to travel around a little bit in Europe. And this year we took a road trip from South Sweden up through all of Denmark, stopped in a bunch of places, um, had a bunch of seafood and ended up ferrying over from Denmark to Norway, Stavanger, Norway. It was kind of the beginning of fjord country. Um, drove all over the fjords there, ended up in Bergen, which is also on the coast. Um, drove some more, hit more fjords. It's never ending fjords, but the fjords of Norway are gorgeous. Right. Anyways, ended up looping around, stopping in Oslo, and then coming through Gothenburg back home to South Sweden, where I'm, where I'm from. So that was, that was a fun 12-day road trip. Um, but Man. the fjords of Norway, hard to beat, really hard to beat. Yeah. Sign me up. I'll have to get some yeah. pictures from both you and Rajesh's travels. Uh, Greg, uh, that's probably music to your ears, both what both of these uh, panelists have shared. What, what's one of your favorite recent adventures? Uh, let's see. I drove five hours back from the beach <laughs> to Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously spending the summer at the beach has been really, really nice, but I'm a huge fan of the Nordics. So Rajesh and I in the prep conversation talked about one of the most silent and beautiful places on the planet, Los Bigots, which is a, it's the former king of Norway's hunting, was hunting lodge, which the lodge, which is very modest, is still on site there. But it's an incredibly silent place. So when I was running Blue Ridge four times a year, I would go around the world to all of our offices around the world. And I would always end in Norway with two days of solid rest. Um, nice. With the windows open. It doesn't get dark at night. Uh, just, it's a beautiful place. So that's got to be one of my favorite places on the planet. So we're going to have to find a way to broadcast live uh, from some of those places, uh, Greg. In, in Good the luck. They barely get phone service, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but they well, have a great well, bar, Scott. <laughs> uh, perfect. That sounds like a great trip. Um, thank you all for humoring us. Uh, we love getting to know our guests a little bit better, but we're going to move on. I'm going to share a couple of quick comments. Uh, Big Show Bob Bova just returned from Pauly's Island. He's heading oh. to France tomorrow, Lyon, France tomorrow. That sounds like a wonderful trip. Glormar loves Sweden and the pancakes. She doesn't mention the pea soup. We'll see if she uh, wants a way in there. So, meet, great to have you here via LinkedIn. Let us know where you came in from. And finally, which really tees us up into moving into um, our get to work discussion. Jeffrey, great to have you back. Uh, enjoyed your appearance here uh, and love your comments. He says, uh, sustainable is a good word. Multiple meanings in this current environment and ESG journey, in addition to the variability we have seen in the last years. Good stuff there. So speaking of, and we're going to talk a lot about sustainability here today, but we want to start in a different area, a related area, but a little bit different. So, you know, with all of the economic and pandemic related events, you know, as we all know, supply chains have been impacted in all sorts of ways, big, small, somewhere in between. And many of them uh, are still recovering. So as we all can embrace and appreciate effective supply chain risk management is critical uh, to avoid uh, disruption and to mitigate this, the disruption that's out there. So I want to start here, uh, Rajesh, with you. What's What do you think is important for organizations to consider in truly and effectively managing supply chain risk? Yes, I think I think that's the risk is interestingly becoming an important topic. Topic like you know risk management was typically uh, and typically it was more useful for you know commodity type of industries earlier. Like you know I had seen that agri trading companies or you know petroleum and companies those were having risk management as a critical function. But increasingly now risk management is becoming as an important function like your say procurement or transportation or you know manufacturing kind of function. So uh, organizations are looking risk from different perspective, you know, even looking at where they set up their uh, locations of their factories, warehouses, et cetera, from location perspective, risk management from the supply perspective, they're in the sense that are there onboarded right suppliers, are, are too many suppliers are located in particular region or particular country, because that all increases the risk in supply chain. So 
I think it's becoming a bigger topic now. People are re-evaluating their network. Companies are really looking at because in pre-pandemic area, I was knowing a lot of people who were not knowing beyond their tier one suppliers. You know, who from where the supply they are getting the tier one suppliers are getting from tier two, and probably all tier two and tier three bases were, you know, in particular countries it was very much concentrated. But now people are really looking at. That where the network really is. So I think we we all talked about supply chain network, but it was essentially to the direct customers and direct suppliers. But I think the COVID and you know the current situations forced people really to rethink the network and you know what is their risk in the entire network in terms of their locations and the locations of their critical suppliers as well. Thank you, Rajesh. I uh, love your emphasis on, on uh, proactive, uh, the proactive approach to managing risk, the footprint, and how you allude to that any risk up and down, uh, upstream and downstream supply chain is it got to be a, um, uh, accountable to overall uh, a successful risk management strategy. Mark, weigh in. What do you think is important here? Yes, absolutely. I fully agree with Rajesh. Those are some great comments. And I, I've seen the same thing f- from my perspective here within SAP. In the post-pandemic world, we, we all know about global supply chain disruptions, shortages, et cetera, problems all along the supply chain. And, and a, lot, a lot of it is global, right? We manufacture and source in Far East Asia, other China, other places, and consume and ship to other parts of the world. So what I've seen is that where companies, manufacturers have had good, strong relationships historically with first-tier suppliers, uh, now they're getting into, okay, there's select few second tier, maybe even third tier suppliers that we have to actually stay closer to, build strong relationships with, and keep tabs on them and, t- and share information and data points to a much higher frequency just to have that pulse and have that longer reach um, and, um, you know, upstream in the supply chain to better prepare. It, it's all really about risk management and preparing. What raw materials components can I expect and not expect and when? Um, so we see this in our installed base customers. We obviously we have a long list of customers, and some of them that I've worked with are are, um, are deploying new methods and and techniques, software from us, but also standing up new business teams to actually go build deeper and new relationships. Um, starting to model those suppliers and those materials in their overall supply chain plan. Um, I think that's that's very prevalent, and a lot of them are also saying this is not just oh you know the pandemic was a blip couple of years of disruption and then we're going to go back to normal. No, mm-hmm. what I'm hearing is, no, oh, this is the new normal. We are going to live in a, in a, in a, in a constrained and disruptive supply chain world uh, and deploying new teams, org models and software to stay much closer to your, your tiers of suppliers is, is sort of becoming the norm. You know, that's, yep. that's a lot of that. It's very, you know, very fully with Rajesh's comments there. I see the same thing. It's the world we live in. And, and Greg, coming to you next, uh, about midway through Mark's response there was, uh, he, he, what can I expect and when? Man, if we had answers to those questions day in and day out. But what, what your take, Greg, on what we just heard from our two panelists here? Yeah, I, I think that um, the, around uh, regarding risk in supply chain, we have become less myopic because in the past, it was predominantly one risk that we cared about, cost. Right. Mm-hmm. How do we do it the cheapest? And we use the most dangerous term ever introduced to supply chain, all other things being equal. Right. And the thing that we have recognized through the pandemic and economic and geopolitical crisis over the last couple of years is that all other things are never equal in supply chain. And I think what's really changed is that supply chain used to operate in this dark back room that nobody ever heard of or even really cared about as as long as all other things remained equal now that the consumer all the way down to the consumer and even the most untalented of all people on the planet politicians are aware of of (laughs) the supply chain i I think we can we can we have no place to hide and we have to understand that risk is more than just cost it is it is about deliverability and deliverability accrues to the defense and the and the value of your brand it's really a delivery of your brand promise that supply chain provides, not just delivery of your products. And we've seen companies, and we talk about it all the time, Scott, companies whose brands have been damaged because of their inability to be resilient in their supply chain and not just low cost. Yep. 
Well said. Um, a couple of quick comments here. Uh, Jeffrey says, from my experience, many companies approach risk management in probably one size fits all. <laughs> uh, similar uh, business continuity planning creation. The risk is not making it a key part of your SNOP process to embed and make visible the risk portfolio to drive the right strategies. Hashtag fluid, fluid versus stagnant. Well said, Jeffrey, man. Uh, Sumit, thanks for tuning in from Ontario and Canada and answering our question. Uh, Shelly, we got some kindred spirits here. She's also Swedish, so maybe we can compare recipes <laughs> later. Uh, that's and, a long list of people if you get to Minnesota and Wisconsin. And, right. right. <laughs> and finally, Stephen, great to have you here. Just got back from Long Island. Bagels and pizza. Oh, yeah. Love that. Worthwhile um, trip. Yes, it is. Uh, all right. So uh, hunger pains continuing. Moving right along. Uh, resiliency and security. Of course, it's dominated the business landscape. Only more so in recent years, right? Um Many global businesses are having to address these areas. And of course, global supply chains do. So Rajesh, back to you. Can you tell us how IBM Consulting and SAP have aided the supply chain industry and what's, hey, what's important for businesses to consider in these areas? Correct. So uh, I think I think we started with that. So IBM and SAP, are, uh, this year, they were celebrating our 15th year's anniversary of our partnership. So, 50 years we are working together. And uh, in terms of technology, uh, SAP and IBM are working together for leveraging sustainability and how we can use technology for you know uh, giving more sustainable solutions. And along with uh, SAP, IBM is also building a lot of sustainability solutions. And some of the solutions you can see in SAP's Hudson Yard uh, and in Sustainability Center in New York. And, uh, and we are so as you know, for many companies, sustainability is a starting point, and the focus is really starting with analytics. You know, just to understand that what is their carbon footprint, or you know how sustainable they are now, and then uh, they are really getting to the next stage, which is how we can design the processes which are more sustainable. So in this regard, I was thinking about uh, discussing a case study. So do you think that will be a right thing to do next? Well. So let's um, let's talk about that in just a second. I want to get Mark also to weigh in before we, we talk about the case study and talk take a deeper dive in sustainability. When it comes to resiliency, and so Rajesh, I'll be right back with you. When it comes, Mark, to resiliency and security, talk about what's important for businesses to keep in mind there. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's piggybacking off of what Rajesh said there too. So, you know, SAP celebrates its 50th anniversary, did so back in April and Pretty much, we've been a partner with IBM for that whole duration and at, at many different levels, right? At many different levels, consulting with each other's customers and vendors. We've done projects, co-innovation projects on software and so forth. Um, and so there is a longstanding history here. And, and, and IBM and IBM's consulting arm, which incidentally, I used to work for IBM Consulting before joining SAP okay. 22 years ago. Uh, and I've since go to work with my old colleagues at IBM there, too. Uh, but but again, it goes goes back into uh, the security of supply chain. It used to be that you it used to be that the issue was all right. We're focusing on cost uh, on one hand. We're focusing on service levels to customers to um, to improve revenue, uh, and those were kind of the two metrics uh, and a lot of different things in between, such as warehouse churn and, and so forth. But but now in the post pandemic world, when we live in in a in a fragmented dis disrupted supply chain, security becomes security becomes a whole different thing. Now you're not talking, oh, there's an earthquake or, or a strike in some country. Now you're now you're getting into, okay, is there enough uh, crane operators in Oakland Harbor? Um, is right. there enough train cars available? Uh, is there enough people to load and unload train cars? Do the customs authority have enough people to process all the inbound or inbound or outbound shipments? It's so many, there's so many points now in the global supply chain where disruptions are possible um, that I think that goes in, it redefines risk management, it redefines resiliency, uh, and it redefines what a secure supply chain really means. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, that's a whole, whole breadth of more considerations to really think about. All those things you mentioned, many of those things were given 
right? But now yes, that's part of the, the the changing paradigm that is global supply chain, and you can't make assumptions. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do here, we're just, I'm going to come back to you in just a second. We'll touch on the partnership. We'll touch on your case study. But before we do, Greg, weigh in on what we're talking about here, some of the thoughts here around resiliency and security and global supply chain. Yeah, well, I, I think resiliency was long ignored, right, as, as a key to supply chain. It was all about economic optimization um, or, or cost, let's just call it cost reduction, um, and we talked about that a little bit in, you know, in the last segment, but um, now it is more important than ever to be all the keywords, agile, resilient, right? Um, reduced fragility, all of those things. And I think that is critical because what we tried to do and Mark and, and Rajesh, you may have been part of this. I was, I'll confess. We used to try to forecast our way out of everything. Mm -hmm. Right. If we could just forecast better, we would be better off. And the truth is, in large part, even in science and supply chain um, education, we I won't say ignored, but we understated the need for resiliency, for responsiveness and recovery capability and backup plans and all those sorts of things. The one calculation we might may have done back in the day was safety stock or, you know, some mm -hmm. things like that. But we have to build resiliency into the core, into the business process of supply chain, expecting, right? I think the best piece of advice I ever got when I got into supply chain is, is expect that everyone will fail you. And if you do that, it's not, a, not the most sunny outlook on life, but if you do that, you build provision for the fact that at every tier, those multiple tiers that Rajesh talked about earlier, every step along the way, all of your trading partners and and uh, everything that goes on internally in your own company, you plan for failure there. You, you plan to mitigate or at least respond rapidly to those failures, and you're in a mu you're in much better shape. And you know, co companies have largely ignored that, and it's only through the constant drumbeat, frankly, of companies like SAP and IBM that that you know that companies are starting to finally hear that. It may have taken a little bit more than just Mark and Rajesh saying something. It obviously took a little bit of a disruption around the globe, just a small one. But now we're listening, aren't we? Yes, listening and acting for sure. So um, I, I, Rajesh, Rajesh just, did you want to? Sorry, I mean, just one point to add, to, I think Greg and Scott, what you just mentioned, what is increasingly happening is government is also thinking, I think, you know, the security is an important, like, you know, like for food and say pharma, track and trace is becoming a legal requirement. And that is becoming, that is becoming for many other industries, a legal requirement that you need to ensure that you are sourcing from a secured source and throughout your supply chain, you maintain the traceability to ensure that it is reaching the final customer. I was working with a tobacco customer in Europe recently, and the government is now issuing what they call as tax stamp so that they, they, they ensure that you know only only from real manufacturer the tobacco products are coming to, to customer it's not like you know the fake products are entering the supply chain so which was a case more for food and pharma i think that is becoming for other industries as well because government also taking active interest to make the supply chain secured i see and i think that's that's a bit of change which i see in the last few years which is happening so great point. Yeah, let's let's keep yep. driving there. Let's let's talk about um, you know Mark talk, you know broached the subject of the partnership. We talked on the front end, fifty years between IBM and SAP. Uh, Mark spoke a little bit about the impact of that partnership. Rajesh, keep keep driving here. What what work are you most proud of that the two companies working together uh, have 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 accomplished? So I think I, I want to talk about one of the works which we are doing for a, a company in Spain. This is a, a renewable energy company. The company name is Iberdola. And uh, we and SAP and IBM, we are working together because this is a company which wanted to ensure responsible sourcing, which essentially they want to onboard the suppliers, uh, only suppliers who meet the you know, is sustainability criteria, a minimum sustainability criteria. And that sustainability criteria is just not based on carbon footprint. That's based on how responsible they are in social terms as well. And based on based on a set of parameters, which is financial parameters, social parameters, carbon footprint, etc. Uh, we work together 
to design a sustainability scoring system and this company will onboard supplier who actually meets a minimum sustainability score and and once those suppliers are onboarded and who meets the particular this criteria uh, then all you know they are using ariba as the sourcing platform and all the supply events in sourcing events in ariba is only you know allowed for these suppliers and we, which i found is quite different because they are not talking about carbon because for many many people sustainability is, is carbon reduction you know so greg talked about cost reduction i think many people started thinking sustainability is all about carbon footprint reduction mm -hmm. uh, but but that's not their only focus they, they were looking at a number of social parameters and i think if you look at really even sdg goal social parameters are as as important as as your carbon footprint as well and based on that actually they are trying to onboard suppliers and you know and and, and this was i think is a challenging journey because uh, getting data on social parameters is little difficult than from for carbon parameters if you ask a supplier okay how much energy you consumed in last month probably can give you data but if you ask him that okay you know whether you had used child labor in your factory i'm sure that none is going to disclose that very often so sometimes it becomes difficult to get data on that uh, but but you know uh, the good thing is that they're at least considering those also should be pa part of the sourcing thing which i found is quite unique and uh, recently we were working with two more clients who are showing interest in that so it's not about just getting the data first time and you onboard him you need to get data on a regular basis uh, from them just to ensure that they are you know they are remain sustainable during their journey so i think that's the work which i was you know talking thinking about mentioning and and those are kind of new dimensions of sustainability which is evolving mm. so a lot of stuff to unpack here today in an hour. Uh, quite a master class. Uh, it continues these master class sessions we've had at noon uh, for really years now. Um, I want to want to shift gears. Uh, Rajesh, you've touched on sustainability throughout a lot of your responses here today, but I want to move into that wholeheartedly, and I want to kind of uh, adjust our um, who I'm, I'm I'm going to first here. And, and Mark, I want to start with you. Mm -hmm. When in your mind, uh, Mark. How would you explain what makes organizations uh, supply chain sustainable from your perspective? Yeah, I know that's a, that's a great question and moving into that. Obviously, sustainability, we're here talking about it today. Obviously, it's, it's emerged as the, you know, go to trend for the moment. Right. And it's it's, it's big. Right. It's uh, when we poll our install base of customers and supply chain leaders amongst our install base customer base, it's 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 on the top not only top 10, it's on the top three list is to drive sustainable programs um, throughout their corporations. And, and I think we all know that this is a, sort of a continuation of other programs that we've done in the past. Like SAP has been involved with customers to optimize, let's say, warehousing operations, manufacturing, forecasting. There's always been this uh, legacy within SAP and what we do to, to drive efficiencies and eliminate waste and reduce emissions and so forth. Um, back to what Greg used to say is really cost driven uh, for decades. It's been like that cost driven, maybe revenue increase driven as well, but very traditional metrics around those two things. Now, now with, with sustainability, the way it's defined, not that it's completely defined, everybody has their own point of view, but now we're weighing in a lot more, I would say a lot more of the waste side of things. So recycling and the circular economy uh, and also the inequality social justice and social equality amongst the labor force and labor practices um, amongst your customers, suppliers, and multiple tiers of suppliers, right? So venturing into new worlds. Uh, and this is, I mean, I think ultimately sustainability is really about resource management, mm. right? We, we, we've always had resources and we always manage them, but but to, to manage your factories, your plants, your transportation, your, um, your workforce, um, in a, in a responsible, sustainable way, it's it's gotten so much broader. Uh, and I think uh, back to Rajesh's point, I think the coming up with collecting new data, collecting entirely new data points, like social, what is social equality? How is that measured, right? And, and to do that, we're, we're breaking new ground. It's a new, it's a new frontier a bit for data and, and technology, right? right? And cool. so it, it leads to all kinds of interesting things. Excellent point, Mark. So we've, we've got established baselines for many of the different metrics that we've measured measuring for decades but some of these new ways where we want to drive change to your point we are creating and finding new ways of, of collecting data and establishing baselines so we can drive improvement uh greg i'm coming to you uh in just a second as we're talking kind of almost defining what 
makes supply chain sustainable. Rajesh, your thoughts around just that. How would you define a sustainable supply chain? So I, I think one part I think where maximum focus is, I think what we were discussing is, you know, obviously carbon reduction, every company is talking about net zero, you want to reach a net zero target by this. So that's one part of it. The second part is, you know, uh, waste management, you know, how we can reuse, recycle waste in a better way. I think we talk, always talked about waste management, but let, let us taking it more serious, seriously, you know, uh, people are talking about all the circular economy principles, starting from product development and, you know, um, up to the, when you do the manufacturing, how, how we can really, you know, uh, use lesser and lesser new material and make the products of longer life so that, you know, they, they are, we can reuse, recycle waste in a better way. So that's, I think, another dimension of sustainability which is becoming important. And there are a lot of things which directly does not, you know, probably come uh, into sustainability. Uh, and it's a little difficult to uh, look at those dimensions as well as this entire basket of, you know, how you can ensure that uh, we are using water and, you know, we, we keep the water resources alive. Uh, how you ensure that if, when you do the deforestation uh, for putting up large factories, how we ensure that, you know, you are having a countermeasure to ensure that, you know, you are not, you are not creating issues, social issues there. I think these are all becoming equally important. So I think one part is definitely carbon reduction. The other big part is reusing circular economy part. And the third part, what Mark was telling, you know, also the social sustainability. Um, so I think those I'll tell the three important pillars, which is which is equally becoming important. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, you are kind of speaking to the definition and speaking to a broader impact. Uh, we're going to touch on that one more time in a second, Greg. As we're talking about defining sustainability and what makes uh, oper uh, global operations, global supply chains truly sustainable, your thoughts? Enlightened self-interest is what makes them more sustainable, right? When companies realize that the consequence of not having a good ESG policy, by the way, this is an irony I love, sustainability is the E of ESG, right? Environment. And, and we almost completely forget about the S and G to Rajesh and Mark's points that there are other aspects of the enterprise. You don't want to engage in human slavery um, or, you know, conflict minerals or, or uh, counterfeit goods, all of those sorts of things go into the S and G category as well. So I think we have to think of business sustainability, Rajesh, to your point, as much as we think about environmental sustainability, um, because the other aspects of it are equally important. And if you go back to that risk that I mentioned of brand awareness or brand equity or, or, or brand perception, we have to enlighten these organizations to the fact that their, their brand is on the line here. And if they engage with bad act or actors in bad acts or even in cognitive dissonance, right? Uh, active ignorance um, and, and don't uh, consider themselves at risk, their entire company at risk, then they're likely to, to fall prey to a lot of these unsustainable practices. And I, I really think we have to get people to recognize that their brand is what is really on the line here. When they do, they'll act in the most appropriate way. Well said. Uh, man, we could, we could go at a, have probably a five-hour conversation on just different uh, specific elements of what we're chatting through here today. Uh, we'll see if we can't book Mark and Rajesh, uh, Greg, for four more hours before the end of the week. We'll see. <laughs> Probably um, not in one day. They seem <laughs> pretty busy. <laughs> and it's late, Rajesh's time. So. <laughs> well, I want to circle back around. By the way, Kadar, I really appreciate your comment here. Sustainability and circular economic growth are very closely related. Well said. And we'll see, I'm, I'm sure we'll touch on blockchain before the end of the conversation per your earlier uh, comment. Thanks for being here. Um, I want to circle back. The whole panel here has spoken to this question, but uh, if you had to pick one uh, impact that's that true sustainable, successful su sustainable strategies and execution can have on the business environment, other than reducing emissions, if you had to pick one, uh, you know, amongst many that you've already mentioned, what would that one be? And Mark, let's circle back to you here. Yeah, I mean, yes, the emissions we've talked about for a long time, right? And, and then that's obviously that's it's still important, but. Um, I would say ties into what Greg just said. It's really about brand. 
uh, brand value uh, mm. and brand loyalty amongst your customers and consumers. If you keep your eye on that ball and that price, I think I think you're on the right path. Well said. Uh, brand integrity also comes to mind there. Um, Rajesh, how about you? Uh, I think I think I think the we talked about uh, most of the points what we discussed, and um, w one more thing which I should which what I think is also important is like you know. Uh, uh, it, it is the old thoughts, old school of supply chain, I should tell, looking at your demand and supply planning process more efficient, because I think it, it's nothing new. It was, a, it, it was from the supply chain world. But, you know, uh, historically, people manage that with more inventory. So, you know, if, if you're not doing a good demand plan and if you if you're not sure about a supply, so so build a lot of inventory and you no, know, it, 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 it throws back to waste management now. So if you're actually bringing building more in inefficiency means, you know, you are, you are you know actually putting all your inefficiencies under the carpet. So so that also is equally important, though, though there is an old school thought of supply chain. We talked about demand and supply planning and inventory management in an old school of thought on supply chain as well. But just to add that that is equally important in sustainable supply chain world as well, because there if you can be efficient, then, you know, you can do a lot on the waste management part of supply chain as well. Excellent point. Excellent point. Greg, I'm coming to you in just a second here. Uh, Cecil's a big fan of one of the comments you said earlier, Rajesh. Uh, Cecil says, I believe we need to be more future looking, especially when it comes to the limited resources we have and use. Well, Cecil, you're in luck. In just a second, we're going to be talking about what it, we're expecting in the uh, next five years or so. Uh, Jeff, he's, he's sharing his one key impact here, competitive advantage, which certainly makes up what folks think maybe and what they, why they buy from certain brands. So excellent point there, uh, Jeffrey. Okay, Greg. So if you point to one impact that sustainability can have on the business other than emissions, what's the one thing that you would like to hammer home and spike the football on? Yeah, I, I think it is uh, uh, the truly sustainability of the planet. I mean, to, to make, you know, to get rare earth minerals, which by the way, aren't rare, but that's a really cool name. We are literally scraping away the skin of the planet and displacing it to other parts of the planet. I mean, that, that you have to think about all of the physical damage that we're doing to the planet to get the things that we need for a lot of our products. How long till we offset the actual physical balance of the planet by displacing all of this, all of these magnetic materials, right? Um, I mean, that's, that's, that, that, that somebody's gonna make a movie out of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> that we, we've thrown the planet out of orbit by displacing all the magnetic materials. But, but I mean, that's, you, you have to start to think about that because I think about all the places I go where, you know, around South America, West Virginia, wherever, uh, China, of course, and other places where we are just knock, literally knocking down mountains. Now, I, I think, so I think the physical impact on the environment is something that we really have to start to consider. And to Rajesh's point, outside yep. of the carbon impact, right? I mean, we're stripping away the rainforest to build soybean fields in Brazil, right? We're stripping away uh, palm, palm oil uh, palms in Indonesia f for palm oil so that our chocolates don't stick together, stuff <laughs> like that. You know, I think we really need to think about the need, real and true need of those things. Well said. And hey, they, they've made uh, it wasn't a movie directly to that, but Moonfall is, a, is an interesting movie, a little bit Hold along on. the lines of what you're sharing. So check that out. <laughs> Going on uh, IMDb right now. And stick with it. It's a little <laughs> bit slow at times, but stick with it. Um, all right. Okay. Along the lines of what Greg just shared, Dr. Rhonda, right on the money, let's extract less and rethink our habits. Well, Rajesh addressed that, right? He yeah. said that it is becoming more common that we reuse things. I mean, Think of the stacks of phones now. Um, the part of the reason that Apple and other makers, I I'm sure, hope Samsung is doing this, um, is you know are wanting those phones back and paying a pretty penny for it is to extract all the materials out of those rather than to extract them further out of the earth. So I think those are those are good examples and really and truly impactful. Agreed. And trends that continue to grow. Uh, uh, of course, we've talked a lot about reverse logistics and returns to management here. Um, and those would be more important topics per what we're talking about, per our panel's uh, perspective here in the years to come, thankfully. Um, okay. 
So folks, we're switching gears once more, kind of in our final segment here. We're going to talk about what's to come. And we're going to also offer a, a really uh, intriguing resource from the IBM team. But first, we're breaking out our crystal ball. Uh, remember the old eight ball toys in the 80s? You shake it and you get your quick answer. Um, so brevity is always our best friend when it comes to future looking statements. But I want to start with Rajesh. So how do you envision the needs of supply chain evolving or continuing to evolve over the next five years? Okay. Uh, so I think from the, uh, from the, from the sustainable supply chain perspective, I think I'm just combining these two terms, sustainability and supply chain, uh, that there are a few things which are emerging, but probably because this entire topic is sustainable supply chain is a, is a topic probably, uh, you know, getting more, more attention probably for last few years. One thing is that, you know, it's it's not that one size fits all that you need to understand. Like we were talking with a company recently, uh, again, a little bit of carbon discussion, but you know, they're, they're making precision equipment. So we were discussing them a lot about scope one, scope two. And after, after some time, you know, when we were talking with understanding their manufacturing process, they understood, okay, they don't have a scope one and scope two emission actually, because it's a precision equipment manufacturing and they don't, they hardly do any emission. So they were more concerned on the scope three. At the same time, we are talking with a steel making company and we found that, okay, you know, that their scope on emission is the biggest challenge. So, so for every industry, the challenge is quite different. Like, you know, uh, that is something and, you know, like say, you know, maybe say, I'm just saying, say packaging probably is the biggest challenge for say consumer goods industry. So, you know, telecom industry has some other challenges. So looking um, for each industry, I think the sustainable supply chain challenges are quite different. And that is something which you need to understand. And I think the solutions will evolve uh, more in that direction. So that is one one definite thing is sustainable supply chain for all industries are not same and it needs industry specific focus. The second one, I think, you know, what Mark was just mentioning is as the data points are new here because no one knows what is the right benchmark for his manufacturing process uh, for one ton of producing whatever product he's producing, what it takes. So. I think the benchmark is again something which will evolve. I think once the times are coming, and that's where industry, a lot of industry bodies, software companies, and companies are coming together to make industry benchmarks. Because without data and benchmark, it's very difficult to uh, make improvements. Because of when, when you don't know whether you are doing good or bad, it's, it becomes difficult that you know uh, to make improvements. So that is second thing. And third thing is all these new dimension technologies, what we call as exponential technologies, like say AI, predictive analytics, et cetera, how we can use that better to solve industry problems of sustainable supply chain. So, so I think I think those are the three, uh, three things which I think will evolve in the next five years. And we look forward to this, those things uh, more so that we can solve specific industry problems. And unlike, unlike, uh, many other supply chain problems. Sustainable supply chain is a network problem. You know, from a network of industries can come together, and then only the problem can be resolved. So, if you want to say solve, say you know, plastic waste problem, one company alone cannot do it. So, it's a network of companies which need to come together, and then only problem can be resolved. So, I think that's also an important angle because it's not one company who becomes hero and solves this problem for his supply chain. It's it's a network effect. So I think these three or four points will, evo will emerge in next five years in my mind uh, to be most crucial for success. Thank you, Rajesh. I love that. Uh, that's an episode in and of itself. You're, that middle <laughs> point you made about you know lack of data and not sure if you're doing good or bad. I mean, right. we got football right around the corner. Greg, it's almost like you're on the football field and you, you don't know where you are, right? So you don't know if you're gaining ground or losing ground. Which way is the end zone, right? Right. So – Rajesh, uh, I love that checklist there. Uh, or for Mark, Rajesh, playing cricket blindfolded, basically. Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. That's even scarier. Um, that thing's coming at you, right? Um, so, Mark, Rajesh set a pretty high bar when it comes to his crystal bar. Clearly, it's working well. Mark, what about you? What do you? How do you envision the needs of supply chains evolving over the next five years? Yeah, I know. I, uh, great points, Rajesh. Mine, mine are very similar. So I can echo that. I, I'd say this, if you're a company out there manufacturing, uh, try and get ahead of the game. Th th this is not a, a, you know, a fad for the next six months. This is, this is for the long haul. 
uh, and it ties into the you know, global climate crisis and all of these things that we talked about. Uh, but I would start by getting my baseline in order, uh, prepare to collect a lot more data, prepare to collect data. You don't even know what the data is today. Work with standards groups, work with peers in your, uh, in your industry to figure out what this data is and work toward collecting it. Look to new technologies, look to new pieces of software uh, to help you with that. Establish a baseline and metrics, KPIs, um, standards to figure out where are you at, right? Just what we talked about. I think that is, that's what I would do out of the gate and, and, and focus a lot on that. Um, and I think tying it in back into, uh, and, and knowing that there will be more and more government mandates or recommendation standards coming from bodies like the EU or individual countries, certainly different by industry. We're seeing that all over the place. Um, so it, these two things are just driving us in this, in this sort of direction. And but you're going to do it for the reason Greg said at the very middle of our call, which is protect your brand, right. and be, be a better competitor in your industry. Literally, that's what it is. You're, we're bringing in uh, uh, the younger generations, millennials, Gen Zs that are going to be or are already our next generation corporate professionals out there working these companies. We see it at SAP, you know, to hire to hire this uh, this new next generation, you need to, you need to kind of walk walk the talk yourself, right? And as a company, and I think I think that goes for everybody out there. And then, and and the, these younger generations are also the next level consumers and customers. So I think it all kind of plays into that. Well said. Your clearly your crystal ball is working really well as well, uh, Mark. Greg, I'm gonna get you the final word on what's coming up. But first, really quick before I do couple comments. Juliet says, I think offsetting is one way of doing things. However, I think it's about making sustainable, uh, sustainable upfront, and that should pave the way for making sustainable decisions up front. I think she adds, and that should pave the way forward. Uh, well said there. Uh, hey, Dr. Man, I think a lot of us are thinking that, right? Yeah. I'm invested in a company that, that works to provide offsets, but I keep challenging them to, you know, to think about a world where the offsets aren't needed because we don't produce the carbon to begin with. Sure. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Would be a beautiful world. Uh, Dr. Rhonda says, I definitely feel like our young professionals are more tuned into the need for environmental focused practices in all aspects of being on this planet together. Yeah. Well said, it's po that's poetry in motion there. And finally, Marie, great to see you. Enjoyed your episode uh, here with us a few months back. She says, we need to find ways to support and fund recycling efforts more aggressively. She got to tour the Pratt plants in Conyers, Georgia yesterday and can say I was greatly impressed at the capabilities to recycle Corgate. The cost for the equipment isn't minor, however. Good stuff there, Marie. Um, okay, so uh, Greg, we were just talking before we move into the kind of the final resource that from the IBM team we want to share and making sure folks know how to connect with Mark and Rajesh. Let's talk about your thoughts over the next five years and as supply chains evolve. Your thoughts. Yeah, I think we'll start to see more and more demand for 100% outsourcing of supply chain, including the ESG aspects of it. There are 333 million small and medium enterprises on the planet, none of which have the capability to do what Mark and Rajesh have have talked about here, right? I mean, the, the companies they're speaking to are, in most cases, much larger than those companies, and they're going to need to outsource that and, and we've also seen a trend towards companies that they are brands first or they are products first, right? And they don't know or really care or want to know about supply chain, which Mark and Rajesh is not unlike our history as and yours too, Scott, as practitioners in supply chain. Nobody else really wanted to know what supply chain did. They just wanted it to work. But because there was no other way to do it, they internalized a lot of those operations. We're going to see more and more need more and more demand for a complete outsourcing of of supply chains uh, for for starting with, of course, the very, very small businesses. But I think it will get maybe into the medium business market in the maybe in the next five years. And, and that'll be a beautiful trend as well. Um, penetrating the SMB and, and drive more action there. Um, what so does Kim Kardashian know about supply chain? <laughs> Right. I mean, seriously, that's just one example. And what does she care and what, what should she care? Right. Well, stay in your lane. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't pull punches around here. Uh, I love that. Uh, keep it Not a punch, frank, just frank a and fresh, frank and fresh. Um, okay. 
So uh, what we want to do, and, and to our production team, we're going to keep everybody here to maximize the time, and we'll, and, uh, uh, we'll finish this conversation together. Uh, but before we do, uh, Rajesh, we've got a, a great informative resource from the IBM team that we want to invite our listeners, our global listeners, to check out. It's a report entitled Building Intelligent, Resilient, and Sustainable Supply Chains. I think we can add this graphic here. Uh, if our production team would drop the comment into uh, the chat, you're one click away from being able to download that. Uh, Rajesh, um, a lot of what you've shared here and a lot more you can find in this uh, research paper, right? Correct. Correct. So I think I think in this, you can get a lot of information on some of the work which we are doing in this space. And it's almost like... Uh, Food and sports analogies are, are kind of filled up over the last hour. It's kind of like learning how to shoot free throws from Michael jo uh, Michael Jordan, isn't it, Greg? Uh, a Hall of Famer, huh? So Yeah, better than learning from Shaq. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. But, hey, you can learn a lot more about business from Shaq these days. Well, both gentlemen. But uh, Shaq has got a quite a diverse portfolio. It's been impressive to see. But, hey, kidding aside, Rajesh, great resource from the IBM team. Y'all check that out. We're going to drop that link in the comments. Looks like our team already has. And um, a lot of good stuff there. Um, all right. Our time has almost come to a close. Uh, really appreciate the broad, but also the, um, the broad conversation we've had, but the, the, the aspects where we've really taken a deep dive into y'all's perspective, been there, done that experience. Um, lots of folks. Uh, by the way, we had lots of questions we couldn't get to from the chat, folks. Uh, I'm hoping that Rajesh and Mark and Greg and their teams uh, maybe can connect with you after today's session and, you know, have those uh, comparing of the notes uh, business chats. Uh, we'll make sure they get all that information. Uh, but let's make sure folks know how to connect with all of y'all. So, Mark, we'll start with you. Uh, appreciate what you and the SAP Ariba team are doing. Enjoyed your perspective here today, both culinarily and supply chain uh, leadership talk. Uh, how can folks connect with you, Mark? Thanks, Scott, and thanks, Greg Rajesh. Enjoyed it as well. Best way to connect with me is on LinkedIn. My name is kind of unusual. If you punch in Mark Averskog, you'll, you'll find me, I think, and no one else. It's, it should be easy enough to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm fairly active there. So it's, just, it. it's just that easy. And, and safe travels <laughs> uh, as you venture back. I yeah. uh, really appreciate yes. your time here. Um, Thank you. Rajesh, uh, really have enjoyed your perspective. I appreciate you, you staying up late with us. Uh, and sharing it. And, and Greg, whether it's you know, 10, 11 p.m. at night, Rajesh's brain, it, it don't take a break, as, as we've seen over the last hour. Really, really appreciate that. How can folks connect with you and uh, the IBM team? I think, I think, first of all, thanks, Scott, Greg, and Mark. And I think I, I equally enjoyed the session. And I think, like Mark, it is, I think, easiest to, with me also to connect in LinkedIn. So my name is Ari, as you see, Rajesh Ray, and you can always connect me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for your time over the last hour. Uh, and congrats on, on all both of you, all of your accomplishments and, and contributions. All right. So, Greg, let's talk about Mark and Rajesh right before we wrap like up. Like they're not here, right? Yes, like they're okay. not here. What was your uh, favorite thought or two from what our panel shared here today? Well, I, I mean, I think the core integration of ESG, not just sustainability into supply chain, I think that is a recognition we have to have. It is a risk, right? I mean, supply chain is risk management. It's almost redundant to say supply chain risk management, isn't it? I mean, it's all about risk. The risks are cost, your brand equity, as we've talked about, but it's also the sustainability or business feasibility of your of your bit of your supply chain and and things like lack of environmental sustainability or social sustainability or poor governance all impact the sustainability sustainability the resiliency <laughs> the stability and and fragility of your of your supply chain so you have to consider all of those risks equally and um, and I think that that both uh, Mark and Rajesh are are addressing that as a core tenant of supply chain is really critical to the evolution of how we think of supply chain into the future. Well said. A bust a rhyme there. I, I love that. It was very Ooh. eloquent on the front end of that. Um, but folks, hopefully you've enjoyed the last hour. I tell you, uh, my brain has certainly had a workout through some of the concepts, big and small, that we chatted over the last hour. But 
Time is now. You know, y'all, you heard from our panel about the next five years. Deeds, not words. You got to find a way to to find the right partner to tackle digital transformation, uh, sustainability initiatives, and a lot more uh, in ways that you never have done. Uh, one of our comments uh, panelists talked about how you don't even know the data you need yet, and that you, you could almost like fill in the blank with data, and you don't even know blank that you need yet in so many different <laughs> ways across the enterprise. A lot of uh, people say data blank. <laughs> or blanking data, I'm sure. Right. Uh, but hey, on behalf of our entire team here, first off, thanks to everybody in the comments and the cheap seats. I can't wait to go back. We've got a book there. Um, and we'll try to get uh, make some connections happen after today. Big thanks to our panelists, uh, Rajesh Ray yeah, thank you. Uh, with IBM and Mark um, Averskug with SAP Ariba. Thank you so much for both of you. Greg, always a pleasure to knock these conversations out. Likewise. Uh, lots of t-shirt isms from all of you, Greg, certainly from you as well. Um, but folks, these not words. Uh, it's time to take action. It's been past time to take action. Scott Luton, on behalf of our entire team here at Supply Chain Now, challenging you to do good, to give forward, and to be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>